all it takes is a change in sentiment. All it takes is for a big investor in Sunrun to say, hold on, you're telling me 20 years down the line, every one of your customers is gonna renew their solar contract with you? No way. Today, we're talking with Gordon Johnson of GLJ Research. Now, Gordon is very rare on Wall Street because he owns a broker dealer, but the research that he publishes and he's paid on commission basis is often quite bearish. I think you've got a majority of sell recommendations within your coverage universe. Is that right, Gordon? That is correct, Carson. That's extremely rare. And so, I, I mean, let's just start with how did you get here, you know, and, and how, how did you get to this point where you're setting, you set up this broker dealer, you're publishing negative research, and also, of course, you're one of the most prominent uh, negative voices on Tesla as well. Uh, and Carson, thanks for doing this. I appreciate and respect what you do um, and, and, and respect you. Um, so essentially how I got here is I started off in investment banking. I went to Morehouse College, graduated did invest in banking for a couple of years. And then I decided that, you know, I like picking stocks, not not um, being in the office until 4 a.m. in the morning doing uh, the same DCF over and over again. So I went over to the research side and I knew nothing about research, learned a lot about it, working with a number of analysts. And as I learned more and more, you know, initially, you know, you're the bottom guy on the totem pole. So I'm, you know, doing one part of the report, just making sure it's perfect and there's no mistakes. And eventually you actually learn how to do the job. So over the course of, number, of a number of years, I worked for a number of very well-respected, prominent analysts. I started research at Credit Suisse in banking, moved over to MedTech, um, uh, then went to Bear Stearns, stayed in MedTech, then went to Lehman Brothers and decided to move into tech. And when doing that, we that was around kind of 2006, six seven when solar was emerging, uh, we started uh, to look at the solar space. And, you know, I noticed, um, you know, we built these models, you know, our research models would simply be like, you know, the, the earnings driver model would just be like revenue growth. We just make an assumption on revenue growth, make an assumption on what the costs were going to grow. And that's how we got to our, you know, our, our gross profit. Um, and then we took a percentage of, you know, OpEx's revenue. But the point is, the earnings driver model we were building, uh, in my view, now, 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 you know, versus what, what I do now was kind of a joke. So, Basically, I looked at solar and I saw a massive oversupply emerging. And I went to my boss at the time and I said, hey, we should have sell ratings on these stocks. I was essentially kind of informed that when you work at a bulge bracket, you can't really have sell ratings. And if you do, you know, they have to be very few and far between because really the business that pays the bank, the, the bulge bracket bank, the, you know, the, the Goldman, the Lehman, the um, the the the, the JP Morgan, et cetera, is the investment banking business. And if you're an analyst with a sell rating, you're not going to get that business. I saw a real opportunity. And there was this guy that started working at Lehman at the time. He was what you call a desk analyst. But previously, he had worked at hedge funds. And he used to come upstairs on our floor, literally go to every um, uh, tech analyst's office and tell them essentially what he thought. He knew the space is better than all the analysts, so he would educate them. But he took a liking in me and he said, listen, you're onto something here with solar. So I decided to branch off on my own. And I initiated on three stocks, First Solar, Sun Power, at the time, MEMC Electronics, uh, with all cell ratings. Um, you know, it was a very small um, uh, 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 firm I worked at, um, uh, initiated with cell ratings, and, you know, it, it worked out. Why did I start my own broker dealer? Where over the, over the years, you know, I, I, went, I went essentially solo in 2009. You know, when you have cell ratings on stocks, even if you're right, you get a lot of pushback and flack from management of the firms because, you know, they're afraid of lawsuits. They're afraid of not getting business from the firms. They're afraid of their long, lonely clients being upset with them. After years and years of making these guys a lot of money um, and, and, and me taking the risk of having these sell ratings um, and also, you know, getting pushback and uh, being told what to do with respect to how I rate stocks, how I write, et cetera, you know, I decided, you know what? My clients are my clients. They like my product. You know, myself and my team, we're going to do this on our own. And we started GLJ Research a little over a year ago. That's how we got there. So what year was it that you, you started on Wall Street? 
So I graduated Morehouse uh, 2001-2 and started in investment banking at J.P. Morgan um, in the financial institutions group around 2001-2. When did you switch over to doing research? You know, I was this aspiring guy from Morehouse. You know, I, I was probably, you know, if not top of my class, near there. You know, I was used to just being successful. When you come to Wall Street, you know, everybody is, everybody's, you know, successful. So, you know, I was used to being, you know, getting all this, these awards and, you know, getting a lot of attention. I went from that to just, you know, another number. The working until 3 a.m. at night, the being out on the weekend on a date and having that Blackberry, that dreaded Blackberry and it ringing and you having to go into the office. I just wasn't, uh, I, I wasn't prepared for that. And even though I thought I was, it's just the, the, the cost benefit analysis was much more skewed to cost versus benefit. So, you know, I, I was told research was a better life. I'll tell you why it really wasn't. Um, but nonetheless, uh, that's why I went over to research. Yeah, I grew up on Wall Street and I spent a lot of time there in the early to late 90s um, in the summer. So my father was, uh, he was a research analyst, but he also had his own client book that would pay him commissions. And it's, yeah, it, it's really interesting what happened. And back in the mid 90s, they really started uh, pushing back on the spreads that brokerage firms would earn trading these stocks and also beating down commissions. And then you had online um, brokerage, you know, come, come or just explode on the scene. So nobody wanted to pay for research. And so that's what created that environment going into the late 90s and 2000 when you, you, had, you ultimately had this, this complete perversion of research, you know, like Jack Grubman at Solomon, who, you know, was keeping, a, I think he kept a buy on was a WorldCom because he wanted uh, Sandy Weil to pull some strings so his kids could get into the 92nd Street Y preschool. And, you know, and that was purely driven by investment banking revenue. So it, it's one of these things that's always really dismayed me how it's just like nobody wanted to pay for research. So, you know, like it, you got so everybody was getting effectively, effectively what they paid for. They pay nothing and they get nothing. So I right. think it's I think it's great that you know, you've tried to carve out a model where you're producing quality research that's you know unbiased in your look and you're looking for situations where people just don't, you know, where they're not talking about the negative. But what what's that like from a business perspective? You've been doing this one year. You've been trying to make a living on commissions. I mean, it's obviously a very hard and odd year in which to do that. But um, yeah, I mean, why why do why do brokerage model versus paid subscription? Right. So we essentially are a subscription model, but. Um, because we do trading business with a few clients, we have to be uh, registered. Um, but with respect to how it's been, I mean, it's been extremely tough. Carson, as you know better than anybody, I feel like, you know, short bias research should actually demand a premium because we're taking a huge risk to voice these views. You know, if you look at the average rating on Wall Street as a percentage, right, at every major firm, Goldman, JP Morgan, uh, Morgan Stanley, all the way down the list to the, you know, the, the, the Jefferies, et cetera, you probably have 90 to 95% buys and the rest holds and sells. As you know, not every, that, that just doesn't fit reality. But the point is, no company is going to give us a marketing day. They don't allow us to ask questions on calls. They don't respond to our calls. You're supposed to have, you know, full and fair disclosure. We are, we are supposed to have the same access to these companies as everyone else, but it's a joke. We, we don't, and it's, it's, it's just become accepted in the industry that if you have a sell rating on a company, they're not going to talk to you. They're not going to give you access. And that that's unfair. And it biases um, not only the research, but the people reading the research to what the management wants to hear. And it's unfortunate because with companies like Tilray, with companies like Tesla, with companies like Jinko Solar, when the reality comes out, these stocks are going to drop and people are going to lose fortunes. It benefits them to hear both sides. But the problem is, on the short side, the bias is so strong that everyone is trying to censor you. So not only that, clearly, but you again, you have the risk of clients pay for access to management. Ma management teams only provide that access to people who are positive. You know, clients pay for you know guys who get to ask questions on conference calls. They say it's random, but somehow we're never allowed to ask a question. So it, it, while you say it's 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 really 
um, uh, incensed you and, and, and angered you, it's almost become accepted. Um, and it, it, it's, it's discouraging. You bring up what to me is also another really interesting point um, when you when you say that you're not able to get access to management teams and talk to them. And when I watched my father operate on the long side and I worked under some other people who were long only investors, so much of their of their inputs in, into their analysis came from these conversations with managements. But I do remember there were times when, um, I mean, going back to, I think, 1991, um, when I was 15 years old, spending the summer with my father uh, on Wall Street, all of a sudden, one of his stocks was dropping one day. And, you know, he's trying to figure out why. And then he, he said, it's the feshbacks. And I thought he said the fishbacks. And I thought that was just some, you know, Wall Street term for something. But it was actually probably the you know, OG activist short sellers, really, uh, the Feshback brothers who used to send out their negative reports by fax. <laughs> and, you know, my father called the management of the company, you know, hey, is everything OK? Uh, yeah, OK. Hangs up, calls his clients. CFO says everything is OK. And I watched my father repeat this process a number of times over the years when there was something negative, like off Wall Street published uh, once on a company that my father had been recommending for over four years called Rentway, which subsequently was adjudicated to be a fraud. But, you know, off Wall Street sent it out by fax machine, stock, maybe by email at the summit at that time, stocks dropping, CFO who would later go to prison tells my father, yeah, everything's OK. And then that's the message. I was also on the phone calling clients saying, yeah, CFO says everything's good. You've seen it from both sides, um, you know, sell side research where you have to love stuff, sell side research where you're independent. How does your research process compare now, especially because you can't get access to management with the, the, the process that you think most sell side analysts and most long only investors use? I mean, I worked at the bulge brackets for, you know, what, eight years um, so I've seen it from that perspective. And I'll tell you, I mean, you know, it's like a management team would come in. They'd be looking to do an IPO. You know, the analyst would tell me to write the note and put a buy rating on the stock. And he'd tell me what the price target was and we'd back into what the price target was. I mean, that's ludicrous, right? I mean, that's ridiculous. I mean, again, you, you know what an earnings driver model is, right? Let's say you have a lemonade company. You have to predict what the demand for lemonade is going to be, you have to predict what the cost for that lemonade is going to be and what the cost for sugar is. You model those out. And that's how you get to your gross margin. You don't just say, hey, revenue is going to grow every year, uh, 5%. Costs are going to grow uh, 3%. And uh, you know what I mean? So that's, that's like goal seeking, right? You're backing into a conclusion versus going out and finding, okay, what's the cost of lemonade at Whole Foods versus Kroger versus CVS all across, you know, all across the world? Figure that out, right? Model that out. Then go figure out, okay, what's the demand for lemonade? You know, you go do your analysis, talk to people in the industry buying lemonade. This is just an example. Then you go figure out the cost of sugar, right? Add all that up. And that's, so that's the real way to do real analysis, right? But that's not what most people do. So when you say what's the difference, it's literally night and day. What we do now is we do that second type of analysis where like, if we're looking at a, a EV company, we look at demand by region. Then we look at demand um, um, uh, for that specific brand. Then we model out what their costs are. And then we add all that up to get to a number. We're not backing into, you know, just because a stock has went from 50 to 500, we're not backing into a model that, that spits out a $500 stock price, right? There's times where stocks are grossly overvalued, which I think now a lot are. So the difference is night and day. And I think the difference is a lot of research shops at bulge brackets and even mid-tier investment banks are really just investment bankers. A lot of the form, you know, analysts I work for are now investment bank, literally investment bankers, right? There's supposed to be a, a Chinese wall, if you will. It, it, we don't think it exists. So I think a lot of people are getting false information, which is why you have you know, these valuations that have run to these levels, right? The real reason is the Fed. We can get into that. But these analysts are just supporting ridiculous valuations. I think it's going to come back to bite them, um, you know, when, when this Fed bubble pops. My favorite example that I've seen of just how intellectually disingenuous um, the sell side research process is now driven by investment banking, it is, was with Snap. And shortly after Snap's IPO, 
um, its lead banker, Morgan Stanley, their analyst published a report. Of course, it's strong buy and this and that. And they, you know, they did this DCF to support a value of, you know, to the moon. And then um, a few days later, the analyst had to publish an update note, realized that he messed up the tax treatment and that the tax rates were going to be a lot higher in the years in which SNAP would be profitable. So he had to bring down the, the terminal value the, or the, well, the cash flows to the terminal value as well as I think years four and five of, of cash flows. And of course, that based on the, the DCF he had published a few days before, that would have knocked the target price way down. So what did he do? He dropped the, di he dropped the, he dropped the <laughs> discount rate. He reduced exactly. the discount rate. Yeah. He said, well, you know, be, the, the discount rate was so high before because there were all these uncertainties given that it's a new company a and, days or ago. newly IPO. But, you know, <laughs> now with the higher tax rate, we've cleared up those uncertainties so we can lower the DC, uh, the discount rate. I mean, it's just, you know, it, it's. I mean, I, I got one for you. I'll, I'll, I'll be even shorter. So last year, right, Tesla did this billion dollar capital raise on the idea that they were going to have a million robo taxis on the road this year, right? So so by the end of this year, they, they should have a million robo-taxis. They just rolled out FSD beta. The videos Off. are, I think, in our view, disturbing to say Off. the least. So we now know they're not gonna have a million robo-taxis, right? Many analysts gave them credit for that value that. So what do the analysts do? Hey, just create another business they're gonna get into. Is it batteries? Are they gonna sell drive trains? Are they gonna be utility company? Like to, like you got guys on going on CNBC saying, Tesla's not a car company, it's an energy company. And here's the thing, Andrew, what the fools will get right and what the bears will ignore from here is that this is no longer about cars, that that's the first wave of growth. And I think people are pricing in an evisceration of traditional autos and an enormous shift to EVs of which Tesla will get the disproportionate share. It's literally crazy what's going on right now. If you have any perspective of how truly to value companies and if you have perspective on companies that have did similar things before. So I, I hear you on that. I could have told you what the end of that story was. He's just going to change some other input because again, you're not really valuing a company. Valuing a company is building out a model, putting a multiple on the earnings and or discounting the cash flows you think are going to happen. And that's your valuation. What you're doing when you're doing investment banking, as we did in investment banking, is the company tells you what they think it's worth. And then you build your model to back into that value they think they're worth. That's not valuation. That's what you call goal seeking. That's investment banking work. That's not research slash stock analysis work, in mm -hmm. my view. Gordon, another way in which you're differentiated from, say, what we do at Muddy Waters and what other guests we've had on uh, Zeros do is you really focus on shorts. When, when, you, when you put out short related research, you really focus on the fundamentals as opposed to fraud. You know, from what I understand, that's because you've learned some hard lessons uh, about talking about management deception. Um, I'd love to hear that story, you know, and and then also come to really how you approach things from a fundamental perspective. Like I said before, I think short research should demand a premium because it's much more risky to put out a sell rating, not just from the perspective of getting access to management, asking questions, et cetera. But from a legal perspective, and let me explain. So we literally put out a note once. It was um, a company where the CEO had purchased a couple of shares. It was a three sentence note. Um, and it was like, you know, he purchased this amount of shares. This is how much he purchased last time. Here's what the stock did since he purchased. And that note got picked up by the media. And we ended up getting sued, me personally and my company um, at the time, which wasn't GLJ Research, got sued. The point is, you know, that was a very long and stressful and tedious and horrible process. When you say the word fraud in a research report, um, you know, lawyers have told me that could get you back into a situation where you know, a company could potentially sue you uh, for defamation if there isn't real fraud. Visit Zero's TV to watch the rest of this interview, as well as more great short selling content.